uh, thanks for coming to my session. Um, we'll be talking today about avoiding disaster, setting up your local WordPress environment for development. By um, so you might be thinking that you know, by saying disaster, I'm talking about something like uh, earthquakes or you know, floods or fever. <laughs> and uh, you might think I'm exaggerating, but I have my own little little story to tell with this uh, that got me involved in, in figuring out the best local development environment. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was working on a site for a client, and I was using a program called Coda, which is really a fantastic uh, code editor with a built-in FTP client for the Mac, and that's where I did all my development. And um, everything was going well, and I spent the whole day working on this project. Um, you know, I had like six hours of, of code in this window, and I was, you know, sort of saving every few minutes and checking out the website, and everything was going well. And the Coda is kind of built around this whole system of working remotely, so they have this, you know, window up there that you can go right into your FTP viewer and open up the files there and edit them, and, and everything's great. You know, it's very easy to use. Um, so yeah, I've been working on this again, four or six hours of code or something, and and I had saved at one point and. Uh, I get the beach ball, you know, it's just kind of hanging there. Mm. And so I, I wait a minute or two and I think, okay, whatever. So I, I quit and I load code up and uh, my, my code is gone. It's, it's completely gone. Um, and I, I checked the website, refreshed it, and all my CSS is, is empty. The WordPress content is there, but the page style is all gone. Um, and, and so I, I kind of lost it. <laughs> <laughs> Upset. So, what do I do? I, I load back Coda and retype everything and spend maybe two hours because I knew it by this point. Um, but I hadn't really learned my lesson. I got angry. Um, but I, I didn't learn my lesson. And the same thing happened again. And uh, this was all unbillable time, of course. I couldn't charge my client for this. And uh, yeah. So, um, so today, my, my goal is to have us avoid a scene like this, which is kind of unpleasant with your toddler around. Um, and uh, so let me, let me start just talking briefly about myself. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. I have a uh, blog that I very rarely update at that address as well. And um, I've, been, I've been doing web design and development for a long time. This is uh, actually my first web page from 95 I did on my, it's still on, on tripod if anybody ever used that. Uh, you can check out those like text effects, so that was all like pre-CSS and stuff. I've got an image map down there, got some PlayStation 1 reviews if you're interested. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I've been, I, I love this stuff, this is really what I, what I do. Um, during the day, I, I worked with Microsoft.net, which I, I don't really like to talk about. <laughs> you feel very lucky if you're working with WordPress all day. Um, I do get to work with WordPress at night, and, and very early in the morning, I do a consulting company uh, up in Newburyport where we do uh, design and development all through WordPress. So the first question to answer is, is why do we want to develop locally? What's the point of it besides avoiding that messiness? Um, and really, it could be boiled down to two main things, which is uh, safety and speed. So by safety, I'm talking about having an environment where you can be working on your code and not worrying about suddenly you know, losing all your work or suddenly having somebody overwrite what you've been doing or upload a file on top of what you've been doing. Um, you know everything's kind of safe and secure on your own computer, and you're not going to lose everything. So that's, that's one of the big, uh, big advantages there. Uh, and one of the other big advantages is speed. So if you're if you're working remotely, if you're downloading, uploading, um, there's there's a lot of steps involved with that, and, and uh, re, you know refreshing remotely, and that's that's only going to add a couple of seconds maybe each time you do that. But over time, that's something that could really add up. And especially recently, uh, when people have started to use uh, CSS preprocessors like Bless and SAS and that type of thing, um, you really take advantage of those things the best by working locally. And you could use some fantastic programs like Live Reload that will detect whenever you make a change to your files and reload your browser for you and that type of thing. So you really gain a lot of speed by working locally as well. So why not develop locally? Um, really the only reason is it's effort. 
you have to learn how to do it, and hopefully this talk will help, right? Um, and you have to have to you know, set up your environment and everything like that. If, if your mom calls and wants you to change the color on her website or something, that's probably, you know, you would just leave that for remote work. But anything else, I really think it's worth taking the time to set up a, a nice local development environment for yourself. So this is going to be a, a fairly high level talk. And by high level, I don't mean complicated or anything. I just mean that we're going to talk about um, step by step and concepts and, and that type of thing and not really go too much into the details of the exact commands you're going to run and that type of thing. Um, so what I've done is i made a resource page that I'll have a link to at the end that uh, links to all the files we'll be using and then the uh, um, terminal commands and that type of thing to run so that you don't have to worry about copying that down or getting overwhelmed with too much of that. And this is a, this is an intermediate to power level track. Um, so hopefully we won't lose any beginners and won't bore anybody who's more advanced. So uh, in other words, I'm trying to skip slides like this. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I do have all my slides at the end as well. So the first step to all of this is, is setting up your server. So basically making your laptop or PC or desktop uh, behave as a web server, right? And so in order to do that, we need something called uh, LAMP. Uh, LAMP is a, a really great set of uh, components that allow you to run a web server on your um, system for free that has everything you need for WordPress. So specifically, it stands for uh, Linux, which is the operating system, Apache, which is the web server itself, MySQL, which is the <coughs> database for powering WordPress, and PHP, which is for compiling your code. Most people at home don't really need to worry about the L part uh, because we're not, most of us aren't running on Linux at home. So instead, we're looking for something for, um, say, our Mac. So appropriately enough, there's something called MAM, which is Mac, Apache, MySQL, PHP. And uh, this is actually a program that you download and run. And within one minute, you have your own web server up and running on your computer. Um, the most recent version of Mac Lion actually comes with Apache, MySQL, PHP all installed and everything. But if you're just getting into this, I'd still recommend using MAP as it's, it's a <coughs> straightforward way to get up and running within a few minutes. For those of us using Windows out there, um, there was something called WAMP appropriately enough, but that has now been superseded by XAMPP. Um, people really love this acronym. Um, and so I believe that's the, that's the main one to use now. Um, there's something called DAMP. I mean, you can pretty much put any letter and <laughs> find a solution for yourself. Um, so once we get our, our web server up and running, um, which again is pretty much downloading those programs, reading the instructions, and running it, uh, we want to install WordPress. And installing WordPress locally on your machine is, is going to be very, very similar to your steps for doing this remotely. So you're going to be um, downloading WordPress, of course, creating a directory on your local computer instead of on the remote web server, copying the files over. Uh, then creating your WordPress database, and if you've done this remotely, you might do this through cPanel or through phpMyAdmin. Um, you can do the same thing locally. You're going to use phpMyAdmin, which is installed with MAMP and WAMP and all those things. Uh, and that'll let you, in two steps, create your database so that you can work with your WordPress content locally. And then uh, lastly, you're going to edit your WP config file, just like normal and put in your um, local local host as your computer and the username and password, which I believe is root root for the default map install, and you're up and running. So this is all, I mean, even first time, this is all pretty much like a 10 minute process and you'll have something locally that you can work with. So we now have WordPress up and running. We can go to a local address and, and view our um, empty WordPress installation, right? So our next step is going to be managing our files. So by files, I'm talking about our generally the themes and plugins that as developers we would be working with. So before we can start jumping in and managing our files, um, we, we need to think of a way to do this so that we don't run into a similar problem where we end up um, deleting all of our content locally instead of remotely. And then we only have ourselves to blame for that, right? Um, Luckily, so there's a fantastic solution for that, which is called Git. Um, how many, raise your hands, uh, how many people use Git daily? Okay. All right. Well, I feel honored then to share Git with you because I love it. Git has just totally changed my workflow as a developer. Um, it's, it's a version control system, which 
basically allows you to have a linear history of all the changes that you've ever made to your files in your project. So starting from day one when you have empty files until two weeks to two months to two years later, you have this entire history of every change you've ever made. And this is really fantastic. First of all, it's a great backup system, right? You're always going to have work as nearest as 15 minutes or so backed up, depending on what your workflow is like. Um, and also, you have you have uh, detailed changes listed here. So, say for example, you you finish your development, and you send it to the client, and the client wants all these layout changes to the site. So you spend two hours messing around with the layout, changing things, and then um, they change their mind. I mean, clients never change their minds, right? <laughs> um, but say that happens, you can actually uh, basically click back to that point in time where you had the website set up like that, click again, and now suddenly you have your code back from there, instead of having to basically rewrite what you've already written. So Git is, is really fantastic for that. There are some other options out there besides Git. Um, there's a whole line of uh, programs that came before it. Um, you may have heard of CVS, SVN. Um, there's something called Mercurial. Uh, Git's the other main one. These, these can kind of get nerdy. Um, Mercurial, for example, which is the other one, the command you use to run that is HG, which is the symbol for Mercury. So these people <laughs> tend to get a little bit geeky. Um, Git, I will warn you, can be very intimidating because it's an extremely powerful. Um, I believe it was written by the guy who wrote Linux. Um, so it, it's very command line based. Um, you can very easily get lost in it. When I was first learning Git, I watched a nine hour video course from O'Reilly, which is two guys on laptops facing a camera talking about Git for nine hours. I mean, that's, that's how kind of, it's, yeah, fascinating stuff. Uh, but it, that's how in-depth Git gets. But we're really gonna be looking just at the very surface level of Git, uh, because we only need it for really two commands in order to accomplish having a local development environment that synchronizes with the remote environment. So there's two main, um, not the two main commands, but the two main purposes we're gonna use for Git are backup and syncing. So the backup is what I was talking about earlier, where you're gonna have this whole history of all the changes that you've ever made. And it's not a normal backup where it runs automatically every night, something like that. Um, the problem with a system like that is that you know, when you're working on a system or developing during the day, um, you might have you know, spent, like I did, four or six hours on something and then have that all disappear if something goes wrong. Uh, Git is, is instead a system where you tell it every time you make changes that you feel you want to save. And this process is called committing. And this it literally commits the changes that you've made to Git's repository. And the repository <coughs> is basically just where Git keeps track of all of, all of your files. So say you, you, you know, finished coding the sidebar for your theme or you wrote a new plugin, uh, sorry, a new function for your plugin. You'll go ahead and commit those changes to Git and now you permanently have your entire project at that state of time saved forever. So even if you went in and completely messed it up, within a few clicks you could get back to that point in time, which is awesome. The other uh, thing that we're going to be using Git for is for synchronization. And by seeking, I mean between our, our local server and our remote server. And we're going to accomplish that by using a website service called GitHub. There's also a few competitors or other services out there like Bitbucket and that type of thing. Um, I like GitHub partially because of their great mascot there. Um, so how this works is, is we have our, our, our local server, local computer, um, remote server which is running the website live, and then we have GitHub. So what you want to do is you would go to GitHub, create a new account, and create a new repository, which is what we were talking about earlier, which is going to hold all of your files. And once you create that repository on GitHub, you then create what's called working copies of it on your local server and your remote server. And now you can see everything is kind of hooked up together, all pointing back towards GitHub. And what we will do is we'll take our, our new theme that we're working on, or plugin, that type of thing, and add those files into our repository on GitHub. I'd recommend against adding your entire WordPress directory into your Git repository because you're adding a lot of files in there that you either never will change or you never should change, since you should really only be changing files in your theme or plugins directory in WordPress. So in our repository, we're just going to have the 5, 10, 20, 50 files that we're working on for our own project. So once we have those files in there and we have them all linked up together, we're going to start working on it locally, right? And 
committing changes whenever we reach a point that we feel we, we've made um, decent progress in the project. And that could be every five minutes, every 15 minutes, every hour. It depends on how you want to set up your own workflow. But so far, we're just working locally, right? When you commit something, you're only committing it to your local file system. When we're ready to start moving that up to the remote server, um, you're going to use something called uh, terminology called push. And that does literally what it sounds like. You're pushing your local files from your server up to GitHub. And GitHub is the central repository for all of your files. So you, pr you pretty much want to do that when you're ready to push those changes live. Next step would be to go to your remote server and do the opposite command, which is called pull. And it sounds, it works just like it sounds like you're pulling your files down from GitHub onto the remote server. So the great thing about doing this instead of um, FTP or <coughs> that type of thing is that Git already knows what files have changed and what files need to be moved over. So there's no more issue of uploading your whole directory and waiting for that to happen or you know, kind of cherry picking out the files that you've changed and trying to remember what changed locally and you know, oh, I don't want to overwrite anything remotely. <coughs> Git knows all of that and you never have to worry about things being overwritten or losing history or that type of thing because that's all handled by Git. Now, if there's, there's certain situations where you're working on a remote server that doesn't have Git, um, so we can all have Git on our, on our local computer. Git is supported on Mac and PC, and it's, it's fairly straightforward to install. But we don't have that luxury on a remote server if we're working with a client who loves you know, their GoDaddy hosting or something like that. Um, so in that case, we can still get a lot of the benefit out of Git. We just can't really take advantage of the whole synchronization with it. So what you can do in that is you'll still work remotely. Sorry, you'll still work locally. You'll still be committing your files. Um, you can still push your files up to GitHub, and then you have a remote copy, a remote backup of all the work that you've done. But in terms of actually getting those files up to the remote server, if you don't have SSH access and you don't have Git access, you're still kind of stuck with FTPing your files. Um, but Git can even help in that regard, because every time you make a commit in Git, it shows you the specific files that have been changed. And so that makes it pretty easy to know exactly which files you need to copy up to a remote server in order to get all those things, all those uh, changes live. <coughs> so, so far we've just been talking about the actual files on our file systems, right? The, the PHP files, CSS, HTML, that type of thing. Uh, we haven't touched the, the content yet. So by content I'm talking about our posts, our pages, our plugin settings, our WordPress settings, that type of thing. All of that, of course, lives in the uh, MySQL database. And uh, the bad news is that there's no there's no real equivalent for Git for MySQL. Um, there's there's some kind of experimental things out there, but they're a bit beyond the scope of this talk. So there's no easy way for us to commit changes to our WordPress database and to push those changes and that type of thing. So we have to find other solutions for it. Um, the good news about the fact that MySQL isn't set up in the same way is that, um, as, especially as a developer, when you're working locally and, and you're making changes, um, you're not really worry as much about necessarily working with the most up-to-date copy of the um, WordPress database. And this kind of varies on your situation, but just to give an example, if you if you get hired by a client and they have a WordPress website and they want you to develop a whole new theme for it, right? Um, you'll go through these earlier steps and set up everything locally, and then you'll export the, their database and copy it down to your system. Um, so now you now have all their content on your, on your system, right? Um, so say a week passes, do you necessarily still need the absolute most up-to-date copy of their site? In a lot of situations, you don't. I mean, you don't need the newest blog post, you don't need the newest pages, because if you're designing around a plugin or a theme, then you still you have the basic content structure in place, and you don't really care if there's a, a new post that they made in the past week. So unlike uh, files, we're not as concerned about everything being completely matching. But if, if, even if you are, even if you are in a situation where you need to have the most recent copy of those uh, of the database, we can still find solutions for that. So one option we have with the database is to work on a live server. And I know this kind of sounds opposite of what we've been talking about for the past uh, 20 minutes or so. Uh, but the reason why I bring this up as an option is because again, as, as if you're a developer and you're working on a theme or a plugin, you're not necessarily working in the WordPress installation itself. You're not adding new posts or pages or that type of thing. 
So in certain situations, you might be fine just working around whatever live content gets put up on the website because you're not, you're not changing that content and if the client or the user changes that content on the live website, it doesn't really interrupt your workflow. And that's something that is generally pretty easy to set up. Uh, all you have to do is edit your WP config file to point instead uh, to your local database to the remote database that's running the live website. The only tricky thing there is that sometimes hosts will uh, have firewalls up or block the port that you need, that type of thing. So sometimes you might need to get in touch with them to modify that, or sometimes it might not even be an option. So, so we look at other ways to do that instead. Um, the option two would be to import and export the uh, PHP MyMIP, which is what we were talking about earlier. And this is a pretty, um, pretty straightforward thing to do. There's, there's a lot of steps involved, but once you know the menus and the, the buttons to click and that type of thing, uh, the, the process is pretty straightforward. What it involves pretty much is going to, in this example, we'll say going to the remote web server, logging in, loading up PHP My Admin, selecting the WordPress database, and then exporting it to a SQL or a zip file, copying that zip file down, and then repeating the same process on your local system except importing instead. So again, it's, it's simple once you get it down, but it's a fair amount of clicks to have to execute, especially if this is something that you're looking to keep in sync you know, a couple times a day, that type of thing. If you're just looking once every month to do this, then this is definitely a perfectly fine option. The only problem that I've run to several times with this is that sometimes your clients will have restrictions on the file size, so if you try to import uh, your database up to the remote server, we'll have a two megabyte limit or something like that, which might be an issue. Again, that's a, a case where you can contact the host and they might be able to help you with that. Um, and then if, if not, there's uh, the third option, which is the terminal. And a lot of people are afraid of working with the terminal because it's black and white and intimidating. <laughs> Uh, but it can really streamline this process. And I've, I, at least in my personal um, uh, research of trying to find the best way to, to lay all this out, uh, I found the terminal works best. And once you, once you get comfortable with using it for this process, it's, it's certainly the quickest. And um, again, I have resources at the end of the slides and on my website that outline this step by step, so don't try to you know, type all what I'm saying. But the, the basic process is that you go to the remote server and you run a command called MySQL dump, which is lovely titled, but it does its purpose of taking the remote database and taking everything there and putting it down to one single file. And then you can take that single file and copy it to your local computer via FTP or SCP or that type of thing. And then on the terminal on your local computer, you run a MySQL command, one line, that imports that content into your local database. And we've now made this pretty much a two-step process. You can use programs like uh, iTerm for Mac that give you a dual window terminal that make this even easier. So the whole process can really be simplified to two steps. There is one additional step that applies both to this option as well as the PHP My Admin option. You pretty much have to do it any time you're copying by local or remote database and, and putting it to the remote or local database. And that is you have to update two fields in WordPress which specify where the actual website exists. So what I'm talking about is in WordPress, if you go to the settings and the general tab, um, there's the site URL and the WordPress URL. Those are hard-coded into, into the database. <laughs> so what happens if, is if you take your remote database and you insert them into your local database, when you go to your site, it's going to try to display you the live site instead. But that's a pretty simple fix. That's a, a two-line script, also available um, on my website, that will update those two values for you to your local website address. And so that's just one extra step you, you have to take um, at the end of each migration in order to make sure you're viewing the right content. So just to give a, an overview, because we certainly covered a lot of tools there. Um, the step one is setting up your server, so that was the LAMP process of getting up Apache, MySQL, PHP, having that all running. That was all done by installing a program like MAP or XAMPP. The next step was managing our files where we created a git repository, which was going to have a, a backlog of all our, our files and also allows us to synchronize those files between our local server, GitHub, and our remote server. 
And then step three was managing our content, where we took our WordPress database and found three different options to export that database, transfer it locally, and import it. So I kind of breezed through that. Um, but I did want to definitely leave time for questions, because I know, especially for people new to this, there's quite a lot to cover. Um, I have my notes up on that slide, and I also have uh, links to all the, well, hopefully all the programs that I mentioned, and also all the specific terminal commands that you can just copy and paste right into your system and, and give those a try if you're ready to do that. So uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, oh, if, if you could use the mic, they uh, like that for the AV purposes. I'm just curious why you wouldn't use like a backup utility back up the site, the remote site, and then install that on your local. With Joomla, you can do that. So I'm just curious if there's a reason why you're not recommending that with WordPress. Um, I use backup utilities, but I use those solely for the purpose of, of backup. Um, what I found is that with some of the utilities that I was talking about today, like Git and that type of thing, um, you can you can automate the process more. And actually, thank you, because it reminded me about one point I forgot, which is that when I use Git to synchronize and I'm working locally and I push my changes up to GitHub, there's a way to have a, an extra file on your remote server that will actually automatically pull those changes in from GitHub. So that what I can do is when I've made all my changes and I finish with that, I type git push. And within one minute, those files have gone up to GitHub. GitHub has let my remote server know that there's been file changes. It's pulled those down, and it's deployed those onto the website. And so the reason I use this is, is it just kind of seems to streamline things a little bit quicker. Um, if you're not making ch changes that often, you could certainly use a method where you back up, use a backup program, and, and import that. So if you were the first time bringing the remote site down to your local, taking over a site that's quite large, then you would probably start with a backup, or would you use the process of going through Git and then? I would, if it was a site I was planning on working on for a while, I would definitely go through this process to make sure that I kind of had all my bases covered. Okay. Sure. Hi, uh, so for your local environment, if, um, like in my situation, I'm using Dreamweaver to make my text edit, you know, edit my code, and I just do command shift U and it puts it up on the server. So how would I, my workflow have to change if I use GitHub to do that? Then the second question is, um, uh, does GitHub then have my FTP password to send stuff over to the remote, or how is that? Uh, okay, um, so you could you could keep using Dreamweaver like normal. That process wouldn't change at all. Um, in terms of incorporating Git into your workflow, and um, this this is an important part, but I didn't want to confuse people by going too much off scope. But what happens is you have a a program like. Um, um, there's programs like GitHub for Mac or Source Tree or Tower. If you Google Git client, you'll find hundreds of results. And these give you a new program which shows you in a window all the changes that you've been making. So say you make a change in Dreamweaver, you hit save, you'll see that file pop up in the Git window showing you the difference, the, the changes that have been made since the last time you, you committed it to, that, to uh, Git. And then once you've made some changes that you like, then you switch over to that Git window and you you press the commit button, type in a quick message about the changes that you've made, and um, then you can push and continue that process. Um, and then for your second question, the, the way to get that whole process, the synchronization working automatically, that gets a little bit um, technical. There are some actually paid options out there, like um, a company makes a solution called uh, Ramp, I believe, oh, there's that AMP. Again, right? um, they, they have a paid product that helps with that. Um, Word, the Word, automatic makers of WordPress are also working on something called WP Stack that I believe tries to automate this as well. But if you're trying to do it through this method, um, what you have to do is you, on your remote server, um, you add this file, and this is what I was just talking about a second ago, uh, that's called a hook. And what a hook does is it monitors for any changes in your Git repository. And this specific hook will say, okay, let me know whenever somebody has pushed new files or new changes to the GitHub repository. And so what happens is that hook is alerted, and then the hook automatically pulls down those changes. So that automates the process. And this hook file is something that you might not understand what it does, but you upload it to your server once, and then it automatically takes over from there. Um, you could also do it manually, which I talked about in the presentation, where you um, SSH to your remote server, and you type git pull, 
and that does this just manually instead of automatically. But it's a little bit simpler. So the uh, the hook part on the remote server does that then run in Berkman script or something there, or what? what trick I think that's a good question. Um, I think that hooks listen in to like GitHub um, kind of pings them when the changes are made, uh -huh. but I, I'm not 100% sure on that. Right. Sure. We use a, a really similar workflow to what you, you described, but we've kind of there's a situation a couple of times where we've had, you know, we've been working off offline, you know, and the, the client site is, is live. And, um, you know, we'll be working, developing someone. We do have to touch the database. We have to change a, a content a page type or something like that. Um, and then what will happen is there's an approval process, and the thing sits around for days or weeks. And the live site is, is, is being updated and, and is out of the world. And we've never really been able to solve that sync, that last sync, when the thing is finally ready to get pushed live. Then you have a very out of sync database. And I did, wondered if you had any suggestions there or words of yeah. wisdom. I can empathize with you, certainly. <laughs> yeah. um, when I showed earlier with the sad face that there's no yeah. gift for MySQL, um, as you know, or, you may know, um, Git handles merges wonderfully. Mm. Like a situation like that, where if you're making changes locally and someone's making changes remotely, <coughs> when you go to synchronize all those, um, Git will say, wait a second, there's been changes made here, changes made there, these aren't in sync. Let me show you what's different and you can pick and choose. It's an awesome system. And that's actually what Git was made for, was, was distributed teams. So you could have all these people working on these files at the same time without overwriting each other. Um, there's nothing, no option that I know of with databases where there's like a database diff. Um, I'm not a database expert, so there might be some solutions out there, but there's nothing at a more beginner or intermediate level that I'm aware of. Some kind of merge. Yeah, some kind of merge, exactly. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry. Thanks. <laughs> but uh, two more questions. Uh, one on Teams, if you have a local development environment, obviously if you had other people working at the same site at the same time, you start to run into issues where conversion changes, and that's obviously what gets for. How do you actually without going into great details, set something like that up. Is there some resources or something that would be helpful? We've got two developers or a designer, people that have their hands in that site, contributing content, how do you work with that? So are you talking about on the like, file, like a theme and plugin level, or on the yeah, database? More on the, the theme side. The theme side, okay. Um, so pretty much what you do with that is you, you follow the same first steps of GitHub, a big bucket, setting up your repository. And then on each developer's computer, you, um, you go to the repository, page that's been created on GitHub, and you run the command that creates the local working directory on person A's computer and person B's computer. And then they start working on things, and then when person A commits and pushes, it'll update the repository. And then whenever person B wants to get those updated changes in, they can pull them down yeah, and start working on that. Okay. Um, and then you can also introduce whole concepts like branching, which is a huge part of Git. I mean, you can have a whole conference about Git, so don't be worried if it's overwhelming for some people. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's what gets made for. So okay, that and, and one more question, yeah. which may may be more advanced. Um, what how does Git work in terms of you have a local uh, development? You push to maybe a staging server, mm -hmm. and then that maybe has a does it have a you could maybe have a secondary repository that pushes to production. How would something like that maybe a multi tiered? Yeah, that's actually all handled through branching. Right. So mo a lot of people, especially for bigger projects. Um, Okay, well, I'll start with smaller projects always just pretty much have one branch, which is called master. That's always just the live branch. If you're working by yourself um, and you're working on a simple project, you pretty much have one branch called master, and that's where everything goes. When you get into more involved projects, you could have a master branch, which you always know is going to be, okay, this is the live version of the website. Everything here works perfect. Don't touch it or you're fired, you know, that type of thing. Um, and then you'll have a, a staging branch, and that's where you can start contributing your changes to the staging branch, and that allows people to check this out and say, oh, this is looking good, oh, you know, let's work on this some more. And then when you, everybody kind of signs off on the staging branch, then you merge that staging branch into the master branch. Thank you. Is there a way to create more than one day to base on a local server? Oh, certainly. Yeah, using um, the same process you would use to make a local, uh, a single one, PHP my min. It's just another two clicks to create database, type in a new name, and when you're working locally, you can have you know, hundreds or however many databases you want to. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? 
Um, I'll be here after, and I'll be at the Genius Bar tomorrow, I think, at 1.30 or something. Or you can email me or Twitter. Thank you.